It is so great to have you here. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging our trustees who are here. We're so, will you please raise your hands? So, yes. Thank you, trustees, for being here. Thank you, Bill Mellon. Um, you know, maybe we can just do a big cardboard cutout of you in the pink suit. Because uh, I, 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 yeah. Okay, anyway, uh, before we get to tonight's program, uh, I do want to express my heartfelt gratitude um, for, your, for your partnership and your generous philanthropic support. Um, your participation in gatherings like this one greatly serves and enriches the Exploratorium community. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, so let's talk about last year's, it's last year already, last year's blockbuster movie, Oppenheimer. Um, as most of you have, yes, yes. As most of you have probably seen or heard by now, uh, this epic story swept the Oscars. Uh, it was quite the upset. Uh, and it brought new attention to uh, the legacy of brothers uh, Robert and Frank Oppenheimer. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I am proud to share that the role of Frank was played by the young actor Dylan Arnold, who's at this table here, who, I will say, graduated from the renowned School of Drama at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, where I served as chancellor at the time. I can take no credit for Dylan's getting the role. Um, but Dylan, it's so great to have you here. And I am so sorry I did not get the residence halls done before you graduated. <laughs> really sorry about that. They, the residence halls were really bad. Um, so thank you for bringing Frank back to life. Uh, for tonight's conversation, we are joined uh, by some very special guests. We have Charles and Kate Oppenheimer here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and they are the grandchildren of Robert and Frank, respectively. Uh, the, the movie reminds us, uh, so Charles is Robert's grandson and Kate is Frank's granddaughter. Uh, just to make that clear. Um, yeah, wow, I know. <laughs> uh, so the movie reminds us once again that science has the potential, put it bluntly, to save us or to destroy us. It's that simple. The moral and ethical dilemmas that the film raises still resonate today, especially, especially now, more so than ever, perhaps, as we bear witness to the, to the rise of promising but ominous, ominous new technologies like AI and the increasing politicization of science itself, with, which threatens environmental policy and public health. I would love to see a sequel to Oppenheimer that focuses on Frank's living legacy, which surrounds us here now at the piers, right? <laughs> After the Manhattan Project, Frank followed a very different path than Robert. Uh, during the McCarthy era, Frank was exiled from the scientific community for having engaged with communism in his youth, and that is uh, depicted in the film. Uh, and he was cast out of research, but he would go on to discover his life's work as an educator. So eventually, Frank found his way into a high school classroom in rural Colorado, and he started developing tabletop experiments to teach physics. Uh, and, and these were the precursors to many of the exhibits that you see on the floor here today. Uh, his success in that role uh, led to a bunch of kids going to MIT when the University of Colorado wanted them to stay in Colorado. Uh, which led Frank uh, to get a teaching position, a faculty position at the University of Colorado. And that's where he finally found redemption. And he mustered the audacity to say no to the Exploratorium, I mean, sorry, to say no to the Smithsonian when the Smithsonian asked him to build a museum for them in Arkansas. He said, nope, I have another idea. So his vision of the Exploratorium was a community museum dedicated to awareness. That's what, what is above our front door. And that vision remains more relevant now than ever. While Robert retreated from public life into academe and continued his research, Frank embodied the idea of radical openness and accessibility into the very DNA of this place. It is manifested in the approachable exhibits that uh, animate our floor and give it such a fun, vibrant, messy, garage aesthetic that 
makes the Exploratorium so beloved across generations of visitors. And that's why, one of the many reasons why, the New York Times has called the Exploratorium the most influential science museum in the world. <laughs> So decades before screen time wholly consumed our nation's youth, Frank found a way to make all of us feel more connected to the natural world from which all, from which all of us have become increasingly disconnected. He said that our world had become, and this was in the 1960s, he said that our world had become information rich but experience poor. And I think we can all agree that that's more true now than it was then. And so I'm beginning to see our larger purpose is to create ever-enriching experiences that shift energy and intention away from the virtual world to the wonders of the physical world, even if we have to use digital tools to accomplish that. And so our visitors consistently use the word freedom, keeps coming up, freedom, to describe their experience here. And I think, I wonder, freedom from what? Freedom from what? You know, I think it's freedom from all of the blaring, obnoxious ephemera that just comes at us and fragments and distracts our, fragments our attention and distracts us all day, every day. It has become increasingly clear to me that the Exploratorium is not only a refuge from all of that, but even more importantly, it is a place that nurtures human development in a world that seems entirely hell-bent on stifling it. And so... Our work uh, is, continues to expand into other cultures and faraway countries, many of you are aware of the projects that we have going on on four continents. We are integrating multi, thank you. <laughs> we are integrating multicultural knowledge and perspectives on the floor of the museum in this great interconnected multicultural meta city we call home. And so the cultural roots of STEM has become a new frontier of science learning that has the potential to empower so many people. And I am so thrilled to say that Dr. Isabel Hawkins, the Exploratorium scientist who coined the phrase, is that correct? Yes. She coined the phrase, is also with us tonight. Isabel is an astronomer and science educator whose groundbreaking research, funded by the National Science Foundation, will collect and synthesize non-Western STEM knowledge and consider ways to incorporate and center these perspectives in informal learning environments like the Exploratorium. We believe this will greatly influence the field as we have for decades. Her work recognizes the value of these unique worldviews in expanding conversations and advancing research in STEM learning. Uh, okay, tonight we are celebrating all of you. We are also celebrating the Osher Fellowship Program which I'm thrilled to announce is now under Isabel's direction. The fellowship was created by, thank you. The fellowship was created by Bernard and Barbara Osher shortly after Frank died in 1987. In their words, they created the Osher Fellowship to provide the intellectual and creative stimulation the Exploratorium needs to continue its, new, to continue its unique work, including events like these. And so Bernard and Barbara, Barney and Barbara are right here. Barney, Barbara, we are so grateful to you both um, for your profound generosity over the years, and especially for having the vision and the commitment to endow the program so that these conversations can be a part of the social and the intellectual life of the Exploratorium forever. So our newest Osher Fellow is Josh Sokol. Uh, he's here to my left. Welcome, Josh. He is a distinguished journalist who has written for Science, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Wired, <laughs> and so on, uh, in addition to having worked as a data analyst for the Hubble Telescope at NASA. So I would encourage you, after you leave, to Google his prolific writing later, and if you can, come back here on Thursday night for After Dark to hear him share his insights on light pollution and the need to preserve dark skies which is the subject of his upcoming book, which will be published by Random House. So with that, please join me in welcoming Josh, Isabel, Kate, and Charles. Thank you all. Kate, Charles, I have to start with this question. What's it like to grow up with the last name Oppenheimer? <laughs> That's, uh, 
it's interesting, and it's getting more interesting. Uh, <laughs> that's that's been the trend. A lot of people are are talking about it lately. Um, it did not seem like a big deal when I was a a, a kid. Um, it wasn't particularly emphasized in the family with a family culture, but um, um, it it's something that people are paying a lot of attention to and trying to kind of. I'm leaning into talking a lot about it lately. <laughs> I would echo that. I think our family ethos is one that is very understated about being an Oppenheimer. Um, definitely a product, I think, of how our parents grew up and the environment in which they grew up, which was, it was something actually that you wanted to tuck away just out of fear of being discriminated in some way. Um, but my experience of being an Oppenheimer has been in the right audiences, you're really celebrated in a delightful way. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that audience has grown a lot more since the, the movie and a new appreciation of um, a really special legacy. So I feel pretty honored to be an Oppenheimer. Yeah. I, I imagine that the notion that the legacy is, is public, that, that these characters I use the word characters. These are real people <laughs> who belong to world history. And yet, you both grew up, at least with, with your parents knowing them, with them being you know, inside the family as well. I mean, what was, to the extent that you can say, the culture of this legacy inside the family? Yeah, uh, we had probably a big demarcation where it was something that was really open to be talked about within the family. My father would answer any type of questions for us kids, and I, I, I really started my journey with most of my understanding reading books about Robert Oppenheimer. When I started reading those, I happened to get very fascinated with it, and then I'd ask my dad, what do you think about this, and what do you think about that? And it was really quite an open discussion. But it was, it was a divided line. We never, especially my father, Peter, was not comfortable being in public spaces and really um, doing public events. So I would never go into a place and say, I'm related to Oppenheimer. I worked with people for 10 years where it never came up. You know, um, I would always talk about it if it does come up. But it, it, it was kind of different to kind of talk about and deal with within the family versus publicly. Um, and that is a disorienting thing when you have, you're related to uh, somebody who's that public. It's like an actual public good, which is um, interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. Um, but Frank, I knew personally, uh, at least as a kid. Yeah, I would say um, because my dad was involved in the Exploratorium and very much loved his father, Frank, um, my experience was very, ex it was very experiential. Um, I grew up in a household where if I asked my dad for a skateboard, he would say, let's go to the hardware store and we'll make one. <laughs> and we did, and that's how we learned about the importance of some sort of shock absorption. Um, <laughs> and that I, I was bored over the summers and my dad would bring me to a shop and say, why don't you make a box? And that was normal that you know like just just make it get your hands dirty roll up your sleeves and coming to the exploratorium was just take your kid to work day for me so i f i didn't realize uh really how different it was until i grew up just that that you know that type of experiential learning and engagement with the world was something that was a bit unique um and i i love that about my childhood, that it was about getting dirty and sc screwing things in, and I didn't love it at the time, but I do love it now. <laughs> and, and I would say for me, I growing up in another country, I grew up in, in Argentina, in one of the provinces, Cordoba, and wanting to be an astronomer but not having a, a university where, where I could uh, do observational astronomy. I, my goal was to come to the United States seeking the stars, seeking that opportunity. But to me, World War II, the atomic bomb, uh, I mean, we never had those raids. My husband describes these raids in the 60s in which you know, the curtains would come on and they had like duties, right, to protect, to do these drills for the children. 
um, during that time, and I, I didn't experience any of that. So when I came to the US, and especially when I uh, moved from Berkeley to here to work at the Exploratorium, it was the first time that I had uh, heard the name Oppenheimer. And of course, Frank Oppenheimer, I, I know that people don't talk about his ghosts being around, or maybe they do, but <laughs> there's definitely a presence. There's a presence about his personality, about his vision, that is so tangible in this place that I felt that I started to get to know Frank through the exhibits. And now that because of this movie, and because of the new resurgence of wanting to know more about the history and the pleasure of knowing all of you, I feel that I have more of an opportunity to delve more deeply into the history of this beautiful institution. It makes me proud. It makes me proud in a way that perhaps before I didn't have the chance to be. So I am feeling quite grateful that all of this is happening so that I can further appreciate the vision that Frank Oppenheimer had for the Exploratorium. And when you see a child running around and being as free as he was hoping that children would be in this institution, and seeing them learning and laughing and the joy of this discovery, it really makes very palpable that vision that he had. And you, and you are describing it by saying, oh, oh, you know, my entire family was very much a make and take kind of family. At risk of stretching the simile too far, if the ghosts of Frank <laughs> and Robert are with us, how has the, the nature of that haunting changed, right? How have the legacies of these people changed over the course of your lives? Yeah. Um, well, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, Robert's fame always kind of eclipsed Franks, right? That was just the, 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 the way it was, and they obviously dealt with it in different, different ways. They worked so closely together in their life. You know, it's, it's, I, I keep recommending uh, people to rewatch The Day After Trinity, because I just watched it this week, if you want to see what Frank says about working on the bomb and working with Robert. Um, but there was just a very, you know, they were both outcasts in a way, and Frank much more persecuted. It's a way that's really felt in the family. If you talk to Michael, Kate's dad, he feels that. They, were, they lost their job, and they were in Colorado. They loved ranching, but they were thrown out of society. Robert was kind of attacked in a way that when I grew up, people would say, oh, he's a commie. I don't like him, or he made the bomb. There was a lot of stuff there. And, uh, uh, um, you know, there's this new acceptance through the movie and also through just the scope of history. Robert Oppenheimer was right about how we need to deal with technology, which is not make a lot more of it to kill other people. That doesn't work as well as cooperating. So that's that's been changing in a gradual acceptance of Robert's place, and Frank's is easier to deal with. Like, he loved science, he made it happen for kids. Like, nobody's against that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I think the... Um I think the beauty of recent history is kind of the uh, release of old stories that weren't true. And that's been a beautiful um, awakening and kind of a cloud clearing. And definitely the conversations that have happened within our family have been really special since this movie came to light. Um, we've just, we've reconnected. We've gotten to share and hear each other's stories about what in the movie resonated, what didn't resonate, and why. And um, that has been a gift that I am so grateful for. I mean, if for no other reason, this movie has struck up connections within our family. And um, that's been, I think it's a really, it's quite a gift to get to know your ancestors. And this movie has made that possible for me, for us, for your kids, and that's, um, and we can watch it again. We can watch it tomorrow and f discover something new. And we have our parents around to ask them questions. And that is, yeah, that's really delightful. Yeah. What, what is the family take? Or are there a range of family opinions on the film? Uh, the simple one is, I like it. It was very well done. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was a really well done movie, really 
well done. Um, it's always sensitive when people are talking about your family. There's no other way to kind of en encounter it. Um, uh, and so I think Nolan did a brilliant job. I, I talked to him when he was going to make it. I was like, that's never going to work. Nobody wants to watch this. <laughs> so <laughs> it seemed like a really bad idea. Uh, and I, really just the craftsmanship and being able to tell the story in a way that brought people into a movie for a three-hour biopic about scientists. Like, that doesn't sound like it would work. And it was interesting the whole time. So really a lot of parts of it um, are really good. Um, but I also recommend The Day After Trinity again if you want to see the real people. So you do a little documentary, you read the books, a fictional take. Um, so that's, that's it's a pretty easy answer. It was good. Yeah. So I want to bring up a, a, a framework to start to talk about what's in that documentary that you mentioned, what's in the film, what's in Frank and, uh, and Robert's legacy. I, I'm a science journalist, right, as, as you all heard. I'm really interested in the, in the dynamic between the oh wow in science and the oh no, mm -hmm. right? The sort of the fun of exploration and play and discovery and this incredibly sober sense of possible consequences, sometimes unforeseen consequences. Um, and I mean, you could, you could see it, right? Robert Oppenheimer makes a device that can unleash the power of stars but in his scientific career discovers neutron stars and black holes. Uh, and Frank obviously creates a temple in the Exploratorium to the oh wow side of science. Um, and I want to pose this just this to all of you, and I think this is impossible to really answer, but what should the relationship be between those poles of pure fun and discovery and wow and um, a fear of where that can take us. You go first. <laughs> Is that me? <laughs> uh, uh. That's an easy one. It's an easy one to start yeah. us out. It is. Um, it, it really is the central question and why people are so interested in the movie and why it's, it resonated so much and what we're all left with. Like, how are we going to deal with this legacy, and that's one example of what you can do with science, but what I like to do is look back at my ancestors' words, and I feel like, you know, Robert and Frank and actually all the other scientists wrote and thought about this so much, and I don't have their level of scientific um, understanding, so I, I look at their words, and what they said effectively, all of them, even, um, you know, Fermi, Bohr, uh, even Teller, all the people who were making that science, they thought that doing fundamental science was a fundamentally good thing, and it was better to understand the world and understand how it worked, even understand it. There was, some of them were so against weapons and the output of it. In the depths of that, including my grandfather, said that we need to do that. We need to pursue science. And how, how do you deal with the ramifications of that? The answer is in human terms. Uh, and I think that's what gets confused in the policies. It's like, well, we're going to make bigger bombs or let's change the regulation of the type of GPUs, but that is not the thing that kind of helps manage the output of science. It, it all comes down to how do you deal with other people. Um, and I think that that time period really was a demarcation of when science got so powerful we could all destroy ourselves. And the only solution uh, that was available to us is kind of the fact that we're all in this kind of global shared existential tribe um, together and I, that's that's what I like to pursue out of it kind of life work of continuing to say that and advocate for that to deal with all these future challenges and I can tag right on to that because I feel like both of the brothers were subtle teachers it, it was more rather than sitting in a classroom, which Frank did, um, what he really wanted to do was create a space where everybody could come together and learn and play and grow via inspiration of the person working right next to you. And that's a, such a subtle way of, of teaching and progressing. I mean, the exhibits that get developed here are, they're collaborations, they're these subtle collaborations and there's this playfulness and this encouragement of playfulness, and I see it from talking to all of you tonight, just downstairs in the reception, there's this 
playfulness that comes with everything that happens here. And that's how exploration happens. And you can see it represented so beautifully in the movie that this was, these, these men were compelled to do this. There was this wonder, this curiosity, and that has trickled down. I see that in my, my father when I got a Pottery Barn fake candle and he wanted to take it apart and he was so mesmerized by how real the flame looked and it flickered through the whole pillar and <laughs> you can get these yourselves at Pottery Barn or probably make them here at the Exploratorium. <laughs> but when I pan out, what I see, and I love people, I, that's, I'm, I feel like I'm here on this planet to understand and help people work together and I look at the Exploratorium and I, I pan out it all comes down to human collaboration. And we can't stop progressing, but how we guide our progression is completely dependent on conversations. It's just, it's so the right way. And we see that here where it's, there's very little hierarchy. There's a lot of encouragement, of engagement with one another. And that's, you create that and you have conversations to guide your creations. So that's what I that's what I glean from my Oppenheimer lineage. Sure, yeah. And I guess you're really making me think about um, something that I have been engaged in pondering over the past few years, especially here at the Exploratorium, which is the role of technologies that are developed uh, from fundamental science and scientific understanding. So I am so much in agreement that understanding our universe is the right thing to do because we are part of it. We carry the universe in our, in our genes. We carry the universe in our, in our atoms. Um, and I, I'll put in a plug for the Cal, sorry, but I'm gonna put in a plug for the Cal Academy new planetarium show, Spark, which talks about the universe in us, and it tells you about the stars in our, in our bodies, basically. So I think that that's an important message, is recognizing that we are part of the universe, the stars are in us, so that understanding the workings of the universe is essential to our ancestral relationship with the stars. But technology is the trickster. I would argue that technology is the double-edged sword. It can be the, used for the good or it can be used for the bad. So how we manage technologies is really where the work comes in. Because understanding the universe is what we need to do. It is what we're here for. Technology is something we need to be wary about. And so Lindsay reminded us that Frank said that at the time when he created the Exploratorium, we had a wealth of information and a dearth of experience. I think that our issue right now is that we have a wealth of technologies and a dearth of relationship, which is where the conversations need to take place, where, where we need to come in as a collective to work together toward a better communal future. I mean, that is something that is resonating with the work that you do in your foundation, the, the collaborative work that you a spouse, and I feel that that is also what we try to do here at the Exploratorium is provide opportunities for working as a collective and understanding our world and trying to keep the technology at bay as much as possible. Like Frank did not even want computers on the floor because they hid the workings of the mechanism of what he was trying to explain. It's interesting, I hope I don't blow up the question, but it reminds me of Frank's comments in the day after Trinity where he describes you know, that process of making the atomic bomb, and he said, you know, the, the, the technology sucks you in and you can't stop doing it at that point, and it, it was just so genuine from yeah. somebody who worked on it. There was no way that you could stop doing it. I work in tech and software, and you love starting to make technology, and there is something about a layer above fundamental science that is human-created, and there are some decisions there. 
But I do wonder in the collective of what humanity and the universe is doing, it also doesn't feel stoppable to me, to be quite honest, right? Like this is what the universe is doing with a lot of different layers of technology. It doesn't feel like even though it is different than science, it's hard to point a finger on a decision that's, that people could make to stop the advancement of technology. So it just feels that way. I, I've heard the discovery of nuclear fission analogized as that there's just a lever hidden in the laws of the universe. And past some point in the 1930s, everybody who knew enough about physics knew that lever was there and felt that it was inevitable that someone was going to pull that level, that lever. But, you know, on this point, to actually manipulate the laws of physics in that way required the building of this machine, right? I mean, it seems like the common thread or a common thread between Isabel, what you're saying, and, and, and what both of, of the Oppenheimers have said is, is we need to have a rate of civilizational or social or cultural progress that can keep pace with things like this. It, it, am, I, am I getting that right? Yeah, there was, there was clear advice from the scientists. They saw, especially Bohr, who was the ethical and scientific, you know, spiritual leader of the scientists, really, at the time. And to him, he was also a genius, he was like, it's obvious that we cannot go on with our technology in this way without kind of having new relations, particularly between nation states, right? Because nation states and groups of humans are meant to group up, fight each other, and get some advantage. And they just saw that that is not gonna work anymore. And I think that's the world we're in. It's just that our institutions and these kind of vestiges of doing things have not caught up with the, the reality of the new world that we're all in a global thing together. Um, it's recognized with climate change now but it's, it's hard to kind of change millions of years. So I think that, that gives us kind of a bridge uh, to a family feud from two generations ago, right? Uh, so I think in the period after the bomb is invented, Robert and Frank have a little bit of a falling out over how to pursue those social remedies. And at least as I understand it, Frank's critique of Robert is Robert goes through elite channels, goes to institutions, serves on boards, tries to convince policymakers in Washington. And Frank is very disillusioned by that. And so we all, I guess as we sit in the exploratorium, are on that populist side of the strategy that Frank wants to democratize and popularize science information and decision making. Aren't you guys on the board? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, if one axis for this discussion is the oh wow, oh no, I mean, I, I think that that, the second idea of should science decision making and comprehension be in the hands of institutions and experts versus a sort of populist, everyone learns, everyone gets a say. I mean, where do we think the balance is there? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't characterize it as much of a feud. I mean, the brothers were really close, right? Okay. Um, there was a stylistic thing, and and Robert did believe it, it was such a terrible time. Like there was this decreasing hope from before they blew up the bomb until the, all the years of policy after that, where he was kind of hoping like maybe we can get the politicians to understand what's at stake here, trying to avoid the arms race, really. And so he did believe that his best path there was directly influencing the government. Um, Frank, of course, was even more, and eventually he was attacked for it. He knew it wouldn't work, he kept trying, he was attacked. Frank was more directly attacked. It, you know, uh, Frank's version of teaching the people and making the Science Museum, I was talking with Michael and Peter yesterday, when I was said, why, why did he do it? And, and we kind of came up with, after an hour of talking about telephones and stuff like that, uh, it was really just the idea that Frank um, 
had that thought people should understand the world more. They should be able to touch it and feel it when he looked at museums. He just, he believed in that. And we also reflected on how much more of a hands-on guy Frank was. He was an experimentalist, physicist, and so is Michael, and so is actually my father, Peter, and Robert, and I'd say slightly me or not. We're like, people are just different in the same family. He was a theoretical physicist and hands-on. Um, and so that question of how do we deal with technology, is it gonna be elite uh, inside decision makers? That didn't work too well for uh, Robert, and Frank's eventually is working a little better, like his institution works here, but I'm, I'm gonna try to bring back some elite decision making. Uh, <laughs> try to get the idea to decision makers, that, that matters a lot in, in matters of like nuclear weapons policy, so. I think to the extent that we actually have affinities within the same family and obviously across the population, I think we need to lean into both. So it's probably not a perfectly clean answer, but um, I've interacted with the Center for Humane Technology and their approach is entirely at that policy level. It, and uh, to them, I, I'm, I have my hand on their back saying, yep, you go do that. I, I can't navigate that world, but I'm fully on board with education. I'm fully on board with blowing, blowing the cover off of the, the confusion about technology and the implications. And I, I do believe we need both. I think there's room in one family and certainly room with, across our country to, to approach it from both angles. I, I agree. I agree with Kate definitely that there's room for both. Um, but I feel that the elite needs to foster and cultivate trust from the public. So when you lose trust from those of us who can play with the exhibits here at the Exploratorium and feel accomplished, and yet you develop a vaccine and people are not taking the vaccine, how effective is the vaccine if people don't take it? So you can have all the elitism that you want, but if you do not have the trust of the populations, including all of us here, then how can knowledge move forward? We need both. We need both, and I think that, to me, that is the essence of the Exploratorium, is to rekindle in all of us our capacities for understanding the universe. That is the bottom line for the Exploratorium. And without that, you cannot understand cutting edge science at, you know, across the bay at UC Berkeley or down south at Stanford or whatever you want to go or University of San Francisco. You cannot understand the academic knowledge. Um, and yet the academic knowledge many times tends to forget how important it is to make those bridges. So I think that in addition to both ends of the, of the equation, we need those bridges. And I think those bridges will come if we manage to recontextualize science, technology, engineering, and mathematics within a cultural context. How can we make science relevant and trustworthy? And so your conversations, I, I love, to me, conversation and relationship can, can solve everything, right? So I, I want to know more about your work because I feel that that is... Yeah. Definitely a way forward. I mean, what do you think Frank and Robert would make of our current era? They, 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 they lived in a time when institutions were very strong and they were very, I think, let down by the elite decision makers of their era who actually dropped these bombs and then built much bigger ones. Now we have very low confidence in institutions and low confidence in scientific expertise that's genuine expertise. I mean. Do you have any ability to, to guess what they would have made of this situation we're now in? Okay. I'll go. I'll go. Okay, you just sit back and relax. I want to throw off the cycle. Maybe Kate takes this one first. And then maybe I'm going to get in a zinger afterwards. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can at least share my father's reaction because I think it would, it, he is his father's son through and through which is a bit of despair, to be honest, um, especially around artificial intelligence a year ago. He was just, I mean, he reads too much. I get a little worried about him. 
but it's good. He's incredibly well educated and he is, there's a bit of despair just because there is this disconnect. And virtual reality, artificial intelligence, it's, it's incredible. It's, my husband got to experience it and called me in tears just about the possibility of what this can mean for society. And, and yet, I would imagine Frank wanting to lean into that. I can imagine him wanting to create a museum that is so fast paced that it's, it's moving faster than the colors of the Salesforce tower. There's always something new, there's always something riveting related to technology to show something that we can't see at the surface. And doing it with this need to keep up with despair, to try and get ahead of despair. I, I believe that's what he would try and do. That's good. Uh, it's easier to go second, I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I would, I would note is there was a period of kind of respect for science that had peaked through the 1920s and 40s, and, and scientists were heroes. Then Robert Oppenheimer, probably the best example, like the war hero. Uh, and there was so much respect for actual science and just in a straightforward way, people are like, oh, you're smart, you know what you're doing. And it would be bewildering to see that people don't believe in the power of counting now. Like it's too hard to count votes or something. Like it's un <laughs> unexplainable. It's that you can't do it. Uh, so there's these weird trends in modern society that are you know, kind of disorienting to all of us. I think that would strike them. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing is, I think there is, I have some unfounded optimism that in following the example, especially around human relations that Robert laid out, that it's not too late. We just didn't get it right in the last 80 years that we can go back to those examples of how we have to work together. We have no other choice about our existential threats. So I'm left with some optimism. I don't know who would share it, but I've got it. <laughs> I suspect Isabel will. <laughs> let me let me set you up, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> okay. And 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 you know, let, let's let's keep all of this circulating what we've been talking about. But right, if, if Frank and Robert studied how stars work and how we can isolate some of that energy on Earth in extreme conditions, and Isabel, I feel like your research as a cultural astronomer and your work is about why people care that stars work and how we relate to stars and how we relate to each other and how science and culture are intertwined. How, you know, you're a trained astrophysicist, right? I mean, how did you get into that? How did you get started on this? Well, I, I feel that all scientists, you know, we have our own origin stories about how we get interested in science. Or, but it's true of every one of you sitting around. You all have your passions, you have your careers, you have your paths in life. So I invite you to just take 30 seconds of silence and remember in your own minds why you're passionate about what you're passionate about. I feel energized by all of your silences because I know that each one of you is connected with your purpose, your purpose on this earth. And I think that when I was a child, I found my purpose, which was to connect with the stars by looking at the stars, by being outside at night, by throwing my mattress out in this ranch in the middle of northern Cordoba because there was no running water, no electricity. And so we would just take the, it was hella hot. So we would take the mattresses out and we would just lie back. And then I would see all these shooting stars falling down and then one of them would fall way back there behind the, you know, the water pump. And then the next day I would wake up my cousin and say, let's go find the star. So it was just a very personal thing of a child's innocence about connecting with the universe. So I think we need to find that innocent connection with each other, with the earth. Bring, we're too top heavy. I think we need to bring down our sense of heart-centered reciprocity with each other. 
because that's what's going to take us into the future, irrespective of the technologies. The technologies are, have gone. They have taken off. That train has left the station. The AI train has left the station, right? Just like harnessing the energy of the stars left the station, because it has to. So I think what we need to bring back to the station is each other and our relationship, because that's what's going to take us to the future. So science in isolation, stripped science, skeletal science, yes, you can study that in the elite systems of the world. Maybe that's what you need to be able to go deep and understand something profoundly. But science for the rest of us means meaning. It means connection. It means relationship. That's what it means. So we need to find that relevance. So that, that's where I would say will move us forward. I think that for both Frank and Robert, I would trust that they would believe that because that's what they embodied in their commitment and their dedication to make sure that this bomb, that it wasn't just they themselves created, it was a whole legacy. The Bohrs of the world and the Enrico Fermis of the world, and the Einsteins of the world, the Newtons and the Maya astronomer who's not even mentioned right now, or the Hindu knowledge holder who invented the zero, for whom we have no name. All of those people contributed to not understanding the universe and creating these technologies. So our job is to reconnect with our essence, which is not about the technology, it's about our humanity. I don't know what, if that answers your question. Yeah, but. well, I mean. <laughs> What was the question What's, again? again. No, that's, 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 I, think I was you answered it. I was sitting outdoors yeah, no, watching right. the stars with you. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, yes, I, I want to know about your passion in your thirty seconds. So yeah, we'll talk about that over a glass and I of will wine say, later on. Yeah. My, in speaking with my dad more recently, we talk about this so much, just about technology, and this is the whole point, right? Has done such a good job of driving us apart. And COVID has done such a good job of creating separation. And we haven't gotten better at solving problems. The distance makes it harder. The collaboration is harder. And it's magic when we come together. And you see it when you hang out with everybody who worked on a movie set to bring this movie across the finish line of the greatest award in that industry. It's the energy of those people. It's, it's magnetic. They can solve any problem. You see it when you come to the Exploratorium, which is this land of examining your own perception and realizing that what we all have in common is perception. All of us, the reason it works is because it unifies us. Everybody can come here and land. They can, they can have an epiphany. They can be delighted because it's, it's universal. It, it bonds all of us. And sitting alone for... 45 minutes scrolling through Instagram does not get me any closer to anybody. And yet that's the default. And that's what we need to break. We need to be at Yosemite under the stars together, experiencing wonder yeah. and realizing that that's, that's how we solve our problems. We come together. We come together, we can do anything. So how do you invite everyone to come play? <laughs> You know, how, how do you, I mean, right, if that's what the Exploratorium is, it, it's saying come play and learn and have a stake in this. How do you get everyone in the door? You know, my dad, when he left the Exploratorium, he started his own um, art. All he wanted to do was create art and big art, art that you would walk by at Burning Man, but he would want it to be, he just wanted to be around. And I think this was, this is kind of the frank way. It's, it's like that subtle, insidious, I'm just going to show you delight, and you're going to take it with you in some way. And it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna change the way you go through the rest of your day. So the how, I can say the Oppenheimer way, from at least my, from the frank side, would be get more play out there. Install more items that just spark a moment of... Wow. And the more we could sprinkle the earth with that, the more we increase the wow versus the oh no. We get people a little more outdoors instead of watching the news and feeling like they're alone and isolated and there's no answer. But it's great to feel delighted. And that is my optimistic 
Oppenheimer approach. It's really the only way I know how is, is that sprinkling of delight. Yeah. I mean, Isabel, you, you've thought about this in Mesoamerica, in the Andes, in New Zealand. Is there any universal recipe or is it always just culturally contingent? No, uh, there are some, um, your notion of delight, right? What is de delight? And another way for me to be thinking about delight is well-being. You know, when do we feel well? When do we feel whole? What, happiness, um, commitment. You know, it's not all about just the good stuff, but also just what connects you to your community and your sense of responsibility. Um, so what I have found that is very much in common through all uh, cultures that I have had the pleasure to work with in the context of cultural astronomy come in four different aspects that I tend to circle around. One is a deep connection to place. This understanding that you belong in a particular culture, in a particular environment. I love the exploratorium because when I walk through the door, I feel the place. I am connected to place. There is a culture here. So connection to place is one common thread. The other is reciprocity. To be grateful, to be reciprocal, to be attentive to each other's needs. Another common aspect of working with very community-oriented groups internationally is the sense of self-determination. You know who you are, you know your constraints, and you can identify people's needs. And the last one is celebration, feast, what we're doing now. We're celebrating our donors. Thank you. Thank you so much for all you do for us. Sometimes we're even afraid to say thank you to a donor. No, thank you. That is basic, right? That's how we feel. So all of those things keep circling around in the relationships that I've developed internationally. And I think that they speak to the delight, they speak to the commitment, they speak to the conversations. And I think that that's what I'm striving to do with everything that it, I have been introducing new ideas to the Exploratorium, in particular, contextualizing STEM and cultures. And to do that, you need to understand place, you need to be reciprocal, you need to be self-determined, and you need to be celebratory. All of those things need to happen. And when they happen in concert and you circle around that spiral, you end up with a beautiful dessert <laughs> and a lot of delight. Uh, so. I'll give us a closing question, which is a little bit self-serving for me as a writer to ask. Uh, we're here because of a story. The proximal reason we're here is because of a story, a well-told story that, that won many Academy Awards about a family. Uh, we all believe, I think, on this panel that science and culture and society and technology are inextricable, and that this provides opportunities for narrative understanding and consequences of complexity. My self-serving part of this question is, what kind of stories do we need more of? What kinds of stories about science and society should we be emphasizing? Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put a plug in for the, the hope. Um, there's still a lot of kind of dread and mistrust, and when you uh, atomic weapons is the thing that I grew up with, like how bad they are and the downside of them. Um, I think there's as much possibility to look at our future uh, 25, 50 years from now and feel like the problems that we have are, are absolutely solvable, um, especially when, when we do come together, humans can come together to accomplish the almost impossible. So I think that, that side of, of uh, science and technology, we all feel the risk, but there is also an upside in that the worst problems of climate change and poverty and everything else that we can think of could be improved and we'd be in this, this world of having connections and desserts together forever. <laughs> and reciprocity. Um, I, I mean, I think Charles nailed it, said it really well. Um, I feel like the story is uh, what we've been talking about. It's 
wonder, progress, that's necessary. And when we come together, we can overcome any challenge. We truly are brilliant. I mean, it's remarkable what we've created, what we've discovered. It's, it's truly amazing. And we can apply that towards solving our problems. We have, and we need to continue. And I just want to uh, offer that I would like the stories to be told from the voices that have not been heard and that are seldom heard. Um, because the brilliance is universal. It's planetary. Um, and it also goes beyond humans. Arguably, the trees are our oldest planetary teachers because they've been here the longest, even longer than animals. And a tree can stay in one spot. I have one in my backyard for 500 years, one of the valley oaks, and adjust and live and thrive for generation after generations of humans. So paying attention and reconnecting with our natural environment is essential for our continual sur survival and thriving on this planet. And I think that making an intentional choice to make the voices that are not heard, heard, will make us even that much smarter. Even that, I love one of the stories that you wrote about Amber and what just completely got me out of that story, which is a story of extraction, you know? Amber mines, ext extraction of, of the environment, you know, all for the sake of collectors and the sake of scientists who are actually studying the fossils in the amber. The whole story is the story of extraction. And the last sentence there was a statement, which I don't know exactly, but it, what stuck in my heart was a statement about the people that go down to the mines risking their lives they want to know what the scientists are studying. Nobody has told them. So let's remember, when we do our research, when we do our work, who is in our environment? And I'm talking about beyond humans as well. The mine itself, the earth itself, all the pollutants that go under it. All the, the questions are deep very deep, and we have to go through that cycle of connection to place, reciprocity, self-determination, and celebration. And it's that reciprocal behavior that we need to rekindle in ourselves. That's very important. Without that, I don't think that the stories that we tell will make much difference. On that bittersweet and very wise note, let's open it up for Q&A. Don't yeah. be shy. Were either of you consulted for the film? Uh, no. Um, you know, Chris Nolan had written the film based on American Prometheus. Um, before I talked to him, it kind of hit the press, and um, in a very non-Oppenheimer family way, I, I reached out and said, hey, it looks like you're making a movie. We, we kind of have the history of doing the opposite. Some reporters are trying to get in touch. You don't answer their calls, but in this case, I, I thought, oh, that'd be important. So uh, eventually, I got in touch with him and talked to him, and he had kind of written the script, and I said, gee, I'd like to help, and he's like, oh, I, don't, I don't really need help. <laughs> Uh, so that was that was kind of the version of it. They were, they were they would entertain us when we kind of um, like um, invited ourselves onto the set once or twice. So that that was kind of nice, but um, there wasn't a real consultation. Thank you. Not very reciprocal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's actually Chris had told me about that. He is a really nice guy. We had a long conversation about it, and he said, you know, in Hollywood. People kind of come around and try to take a piece of your thing, and I realized later he was talking about me. 
you know, like he was just trying to understand, am I going to go after him? And like I had other people approach me later and said, you know, you can go sue Universal. And, you know, I, I made it very clear to him when I talked to him, I wasn't trying to sue him or go after him, but I also wasn't able to exert any kind of influence or input. And, you know, that is part of being an Oppenheimer. You're, it is a family value that my father holds that I don't necessarily, he's like, it's a public story, it's not ours. People are going to say anything they want about Robert Oppenheimer. It's not you. So he's got a good attitude about it. I'm more of a, like, can I get a piece of this? Like, this is my family. But uh, anyway, that was the experience with the movie is not exactly consulted and has no relation to the family. Yeah. Uh, uh, back to your four theories, I uh, so just elaborate for a second on self-determination, celebration, reciprocity, all rang a very deep bell, but to just expand on self-determination. Self-determination. Yeah, on how that w relates to the other three. Yeah, I, I think of it as being able, as you dynamically belong in a community, whatever community that might be, how do you understand constraints and needs and values so that you can make decisions on behalf of the community in ways that preserve who you are, your identity as a community, your, your values, right? So as I think that when I think of it in, in the context of the Exploratorium, when we work with communities, you know, we have a Latin, Latinx or Latino uh, audience engagement initiative. Um, so how, how will we uh, look at that aspect of self-determination. To me, it means that we understand constraints, both from our perspective in the museum and from their perspective in community, and we understand needs and we understand values, because they're going to be who they are, and we are going to be who we are. There are things that are worthy of maintaining, which is your, 